Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back everyone. So, uh, in the last session we were discussing experiments and uh, we have already talked about and defined the average treatment effect and the average treatment on the treated and we have also seen an example of experiment in reality when it was conducted in the, in the case of um, rainfall insurance, marketing rainfall insurance in Gujarat um, in India. Today we are going to take the discussion forward and uh, discuss about, uh, so in, in the previous paper that I discussed with you, you have seen that uh, one of the most important uh, parts of an experiment is to establish the validity of the assumption of the conditional independence um, of the error with the, uh, with the treatment dummy. And uh, one of the ways in which we have seen, uh, or in which we, in which we actually validated the assumption was to see if the covariates that is the x naught i's are balanced between the treatment and the control group before the experiment is actually, uh, uh, actually um, instituted. What we are going to do today is start a discussion on why do we need or the general importance of um, collecting data on these x naught i's. So, let us look at the use of other regressors, the importance of the use of other regressors. So, econometrics is very easy if all data comes from randomized controlled experiments, because all you need to do once you have a controlled experiment is to just compare the, uh, the, the outcomes, the y i's between the treatment and the control groups. But um, if it was so easy, if you could establish that it was a, a perfectly run randomization, do we at all need data on other variables or do we just need to collect data on treatment and control and the outcome variables and just compare the means as I said or do we need data on other variables at all. So, we can get consistent estimates of treatment without worrying about other variables if you had a perfectly, um, uh, uh, perfectly randomized treatment and control. However, the problem is that randomization could go wrong. So, in reality when we institute an experiment and we randomly pick one unit of observation whether it is an individual or it is a farm or uh, any unit of observation for that matter. So, when you pick one individual or a farm randomly how do we actually do the randomization. So, we would fit, we would try to um, feed a computer with the number of observation by the number of data that we have, number of points of observations and ask the computer to pick the random unit or pick a unit randomly with some probability. Now, because we always work on a finite sample, it could very well happen that the computer or uh, whichever algorithm you are using to do uh, this random picking does not work very well in the end. So, we need to ensure that this randomization has worked well. So, one of the reasons that we want to collect data or information on these covariates is to ensure that the implementation of the research design has gone well, it is not poor. It could be that the implementation just goes wrong or in other words uh, there is uh, a non-random selection of people into or individual units into treatment and control groups simply as a matter of bad luck. But if we actually hit bad luck or we have a poor implementation of the research design, then we cannot compare the treatment and control group outcomes and say that this is indeed the true effect of the treatment. In that case, we do need other regressors, the x naught i's as we saw previously to see whether x naught i's are balanced between the treatment and the control groups and then we can be more confident that the randomization went well. But is that the only reason we need the x naught i's? 
Let us see. So, one of the reasons that we need X naught i's as we said is check for randomization. So, the collection of data on X naught i's helps us to improve randomization because if they are balanced we know that we have a proper randomization. However, another possibility is that uh, even suppose you have a good randomization in the in the rainfall insurance um, example for instance you saw that the covariates were balanced between the treatment and the control groups for most of the x variables except for one variable which was drought experience. Now, the point is that if everything is balanced why do we I mean do we at all need to use them in the regression these x naught i's in the regression. So, one of the reasons they could still be useful over and above uh, the check for randomization is the possibility that um, these x naught i's actually determine y i in the sense that uh, uh, for instance if you think of the rainfall insurance example that we had seen before what you see is that um, the outcome variable was insurance take up and the x naught i's were age gender risk aversion and various such measures. Now, it could very well be the case that gender determines take up of an insurance, age of an individual determines take up of an insurance and of course, risk aversion is a very important factor that affects insurance take up. Now, all these covariates independently affect y, these might not be correlated with the variable of interest for us which in this case is the treatment dummy financial literacy program. However, each of these has an independent effect on y i. So, to the extent that they have an independent effect on y i what we could do is we could control for each of these variables in our regression and it affects y i. So, it explains part of the variability in y i. So, once you take away that part of variability in y i what remains in y i is explained by our main treatment variable d i which is the uh, financial literacy program in this case in this example. Now, if you take out the variability and explain the remaining variability by uh, d i then the precision of the estimate on d i actually improves because you are now explaining a smaller variability in y by d i. So, one of the additional um, uh, importance of collecting data on x naught i's is to improve the efficiency of the estimates. Another very important reason as we will see uh, shortly is control for con conditional randomization. So, the discussion that we had so far essentially talks about full randomization in the sense that we have a sample of let us say 100 units or 100 people and we randomly pick um, each of them into and assign them the treatment or the control, but we do not condition on any other variable. But there is a possibility that we could condition as um, uh, so for instance uh, we could think of um, the previous example of financial literacy and suppose we are interested in knowing whether financially literacy, uh, financial literacy program is more beneficial for uh, let us say uh, people who have low cognitive ability and as opposed to people who have high cognitive ability to start with. And this is something we saw in the previous paper which they have done as a heterogeneity test. But what you could additionally do is to create groups of people with low and high cognitive ability and do the randomization within each of these groups. So, that would be conditioning on the conditional uh, on the cognitive ability of individuals you are randomizing. So, we will take uh, we will look at better examples shortly. The next one is heterogeneity. So, related to this idea of conditional randomization is the idea of heterogeneity in treatment effects. So, for instance as I as I just gave you an example you you might uh, be interested in looking at the treatment effect and how it varies uh, between individuals with low cognitive ability or high cognitive ability. You might be interested in the effect of um, financial literacy program on insurance take up not just the average treatment effect, but how does the treatment effect or the benefits of the financial literacy program vary by the uh, type of crop a, a particular uh, farmer produces. Right? So, these are the additional reasons 
why we want to collect data on uh, x not i's which is the other regressors. To, uh, uh, to um, uh, discuss further on the points that we uh, just mentioned. Uh, so, the first point that we mentioned is that if randomization is done well, then x should be independent of d, which is the x not i's, the covariates or the, regress, uh, the other regressors actually should be independent of the treatment variable, treatment indicator d. And this is of course, testable, which you have tested, uh, which you saw being tested in the previous paper that we discussed, which is test for the differences in x not i's in treatment and control groups. We will also see this in the context of yet another experiment that we will discuss the star experiment. The second one is inclusion of the covariates is likely to increase the efficiency, which is more precise estimates of the coefficient on D, which is more precise treatment effects as we just um, discussed. So, uh, to summarize what we discussed in this context is that adding more legitimate explanatory variables, which is the x naught i's would take out some variance in the error term and hence reduce the estimate of the standard error on D. So, the other possibility that we discussed is the conditional random assignment. So, we could also use x right at the stage of assigning treatment. So, conditional randomization is where the probability of treatment is different from different people with different values of x, but random conditional on x. What does it mean? So, I just gave you one example. So, let, let me again go back to the example that I just gave you. So, we were talking about cognitive ability and how does the effect of financial literacy program depend on the initial levels of cognitive ability of an individual. So, suppose you have just for simplicity we assume suppose that you have start with only two groups of cognitive ability. One is a low cognitive ability, the other is a high cognitive ability. Now, what you are interested in is once again the treatment effect that is the effect of financial literacy training on the outcome which is insurance take up, but you want to know how does it vary by different levels of cognitive ability. So, suppose I was I was not interested in the variation in the treatment effect by levels of cognitive ability, but I was only interested in the average treatment effect. In that case what I would do is I would take this group of 100 farmers and uh, randomly select each of them into the treatment on the control group and suppose uh, as in the as in the paper that we saw out of 600 farmers 300 were chosen into the treatment group and 300 in the control group. In that case every farmer has a probability of exactly equal to half of being in the treatment group and the control group. Now, that would be a full randomization as opposed to a full randomization suppose now you want to look at within cognitive ability groups that is the within the low cognitive ability and within the high cognitive ability group and you want to know what is the effect of financial literacy on uh, insurance take up within the low cognitive ability group. So, what would you do? You would take you would first divide the sample of 600 farmers into the low cognitive ability and the high cognitive ability group. So, let us say uh, just for example sake suppose uh, out of the 600 farmers 200 fall in the low cognitive ability group and 400 fall in the high cognitive ability group. And now you would assign treatment which is financial literacy training within the 200 group within the group of 400. So, within the group of 200 again you would assign randomly let us say you choose 100 of them and assign them into uh, financial literacy or the treatment group and 100 of them into the uh, no financial literacy or the control group. You do the same assignment of treatment within the group of 400 who are high cognitive ability, but now you see depending on how many you choose from each of these groups the probability of assignment into treatment is same within each group, but might vary between the two groups depending on the number of individuals you have and depending on the number of individuals you put into treatment in each of these groups. So, that is what the slide is saying over here conditional randomization is where the probability of treatment is different for different people within or with different values of x. In our example x was this high cognitive ability or the low cognitive ability 
So, within high cognitive ability people have a different probability of being treated, within low cognitive ability people have a different probability of being treated. But random once you condition on this cognitive ability. So, D can be correlated with X, but conditional on X which is cognitive ability in our example D is independent of other factors. Okay. So, of course, depending on how we actually um, uh, how cognitive ability actually affects your outcome insurance take up, we must uh, get the functional form of the relationship between y and x correct. Now, the, the good thing about conditional random assignment is we can guarantee that in our sample d and x are independent instead of just being probabilistic. What do we mean? We mean that if we are interested in the question that whether financial literacy program benefits people differently based on their initial levels of cognitive ability, then instead of doing a heterogeneity test as we saw in the previous paper, we just um, which does a full randomization initially and then breaks up the sample by cognitive ability, we could actually randomize in the beginning within the cognitive ability groups and we know for sure that the groups are independent once we control for cognitive ability. So, to understand this better we what we would do is once again we would go for a very specific example. We go for this paper particularly which uh, analyzes the star experiment in details. So, this paper by Kruger um, which was written in 1999. Uh, is experimental estimates of education production functions. So, what do we mean by education production functions briefly? Now, various governments across the world tend to spend a lot of money on improving education. So, improving educational outcomes particularly for primary school children because we care about the educational um, uh, uh, the learning of primary school children the most because that sort of builds the fundamentals and on, on top of that people can go to secondary education, tertiary and so on. But once you set the fundamentals correct, it is easier for people to go through these other levels of education. So, governments care a lot about improving learning outcomes at the primary level. So, there are many competing factors that you can, you can uh, actually uh, as a policy maker you can address to improve learning outcomes. What are these? One of these could be that um, suppose we think that um, it is important that fewer the ch uh, children actually go to small class sizes as opposed to large class sizes because if, p if children are going into small class sizes then what we have is a higher teacher to student ratio. So, we have more teachers per student and what this means is that each student gets better personal attention from the teacher. But consider the fact that to hire more teachers the governments will I mean given that we are talking about government schools over here, government will have to spend more money on hiring teachers. That same money that the government is spending on hiring teachers could have gone into improving other forms of infrastructure in the school. It could have gone into buying more, more books for the children, buying uh, free school lunches for instance. So, you have a trade off in terms of how do you best utilize your resources. So, given this premise what we want to understand is if you spend one more rupee on a child in terms of reducing the size of the classroom that is in terms of improving the teacher to student ratio then how does it uh, benefit the student in terms of the learning outcomes. So, this is exactly what uh, the star experiment does. Star experiment is a randomized experiment uh, and it was a longitudinal study in which kindergarten students and their teachers were randomly assigned to one of the three groups. The smallest class size which consisted of 13 to 17 students per teacher and then the regular class size which is uh, about 20 to 25 students per teacher. There was yet another treatment group which is the regular class size with aids, teaching aids in other words. So, teaching aids are aids um, uh, that each teacher gets in a classroom to assist the teacher in teaching. So, essentially what it is saying is that in addition to the teacher in these classrooms, the students also have access to this teaching aids or teaching assistance. Now, 
what happened was after the initial assignment, the design called for students to remain in the same class type for 4 years. So, essentially what this means is that uh, you go, so these children enter school in kindergarten and you are placed as a child you are placed in one of the classrooms, the small, the regular or the regular with aid and you are required to stick to your classroom whether it is small or regular or regular with aid for the next 4 years. So, uh, because if you do not stick to the your, your assigned classroom then you are violating the randomization principle to start with. So, what happened um, uh, more details about the star experiment, the cohort of students who entered kindergarten in 1985-86 school year participated in the experiment through their third grade, which is first, second, uh, kindergarten first, second and third, so four years. Any student who entered a participating school in a relevant grade was added to the experiment and the participating students who repeated a grade, skipped a grade or left school exited the sample. Now, what does that mean? That means, uh, students, so initially a group of students who entered school, they were randomized into either a small class or a regular class or a regular class with aid. But it is also possible that as school progresses, new students come into the school and join school in different grades. So, for instance, in 19 85 let us say some students started the same school at grade 1, some of them joined the school at grade 2. So, they did not attend kindergarten or grade 1 in the same school, but they started directly from grade 2. So, to keep up with the randomization what the researchers did was at each level when the students started school in that particular school that we are talking about, they randomly uh, selected the student these entering batch in each grade and put them in small regular or regular uh, class with 8 in that particular grade. The newly entering students were randomly assigned to class types, although the uneven availability of slots in small and regular classes often led to an unbalanced allocation of new students across the class types. So, we, we are going to discuss this point uh, once again. Um, because this would affect uh, potentially the randomization. So, over all the 4 years the sample included about 11600 students from 80 schools. Now, each school was required to have at least one of each type of class size that we discussed the small regular and regular uh, with aid and random assignment took place within schools. Now, what does it mean? So, we have 11600 students across 80 schools um, in some parts of the US. So, this was particularly the state of Tennessee where the experiment was conducted and um, so, one possibility is to pick this. Uh, so, you have uh, let us say the small class size, the regular class size and the regular class size with aid and what you do is you pick each student from this sample of 11600 and place them randomly into each of any any one of these classes ok. So, that is one way that would be full randomization, but of course, as you can understand this is logistically challenging to do. I mean how do you pick a child from one region of Tennessee and ask them to go to any any of the schools across Tennessee in a small classroom size. You, this is logistically difficult to have. So, what you do instead is you go within each school and you take the uh, number of kids who are entering each school in each year and within the school you allocate them randomly into the small, the regular and the regular class with 8. So, what you are doing effectively is suppose that you pick one of the schools in this 80 schools, let us say the school 1 in one particular area of Tennessee and let us say for um, example sake that there are 100 kids who enter the school in a particular year. Now, when they are entering school, you take these 100 children and put them randomly into a small, a regular and a regular size class uh, with aid. So, within the school you randomize them into these 3 treatment categories, the treatment 1, 2 and 3 and put them randomly. But remember that suppose one school has only one class of uh, small class type, one regular class type and one regular class type with it. On the other hand, you can have another school uh, in maybe a different region or even the same region which has two small classrooms, 
one regular classroom and one regular classroom with eight. So naturally, if this another group of 100 students enter this school B, which has two small classrooms, then the probability of entering a small classroom is higher for students who enter school B than for students who enter school A. But we want the probabilities to be identical within the same school and not necessarily across schools because once we condition on the fact that which school are you going to, we can still have or achieve randomization. So, what the authors suggest is that past research using the star experiment primarily consists of comparisons of means between the <coughs> assignment groups. Little attention has been paid to potential threats to the validity of the experiment or to the longitudinal structure of the data. So, just to repeat my point, what I just said that if you compare um, the mean differences in learning between the small class and the regular class and the regular class with 8, you very likely will not achieve the true effect. The reason is what? The reason is that you do not have full randomization. You have randomization only after you consider the fact that within each school the randomization worked, but not across schools. So, what the authors are suggesting is that all the previous studies, they essentially simply compared mean differences between the treatment 1 school and treatment 2. Uh, so, treatment 1 class and treatment 2 class which is the small class type and the regular class type without accounting for the fact the randomization was not a complete randomization, but rather a conditional randomization. So, the other problems um, in the star experiment was that student in regular classes were randomly assigned again between classes with and without full time aids at the beginning of first grade, while students in small classes continued on in small classes often with the same set of classmates. So, what happened was that when students were assigned into small and regular sized classes, so initially the experiment only consisted of small and regular sized classes. So, when students were assigned to small and regular sized classes, some of the parents of children who were assigned the regular sized classes actually complained, because they wanted their kids to go to small sized classes. Now, when the parents complained for these kids, what the, t uh, what the experiments, uh, experimenters thought is one possibility that you could also have a regular sized class with aids just to placate the parents. Because if you, uh, if you just uh, listen to these parents and transfer their children to small class uh, size instead of the regular, then you would be violating randomization. So, just to placate the parents and also to keep up with the randomization, they created this third type which was uh, the regular sized class with AIDS. So, what happened was you initially picked those 100 children, put them in small and regular class sizes, but then when the parents protested, you took those maybe 50 students who you initially put into regular class sizes and then you split them up and put them again randomly into regular classes and regular classes with 8. So, what happened was uh, obviously the probabilities, the initial probabilities of randomization varied from the final probabilities. 10 percent of the students switched between small and regular classes between grades primarily because of behavioral problems or parental complaints. So, this was non-random switching which has to be taken care of. Another problem is sample attrition. So, half of the students who were present in kindergarten were missing in the data in at least one of the subsequent years and some students may have non-randomly switched to another public school on or enrolled in private school upon learning their class type assignments. So, this is another violation, another potential violation of the randomization that the experimenters did is because uh, suppose I assign students into small regular and regular uh, class with AIDS, uh, these 100 students and it so happens that parents who are unhappy that their students were, that their children were put into regular class sizes, take them out of that school and put them in a different school. So, that uh, their children can go to small class sizes, whether they get, where they get more attention. Now, do you think this could be a problem for the uh, for for uh, our experiment to uh, run a if we run a regression but just comparing the means between the small and the regular class sizes and say that this is the true effect well of course it would be 
uh, following is the reason. So, suppose uh, it could very well be the case that the parents who actually decide to take their student, their children out of regular class sizes because they were assigned regular class sizes and put them in a different school where they could be assigned small class sizes are possibly the more motivated students or more motivated parents who spend more time on their children. So, given that you are losing a very selective part of your sample who are the more motivated students who would have gone to the regular class sizes that would create a bias in your estimates because you are not losing the more motivated students from your small class. This is not a non-random dropping out of your sample, uh, uh, sorry this is not a random dropping out of your uh, sample, but a very non-random dropping out from your sample where only the very motivated students from the regular class sizes actually drop out from your sample. So, we need to take account of that as well. So, given that there is non-random switching between classes, so, uh, 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 that is a potential uh, uh, problem, uh, non-random switching between class types um, if parents are more motivated or there is non-random dropping out of the sample where the students actually leave the sample to join another school. So, we need to take care of that and, um, but the problem is that if you do not observe the initial assignment of the students which in project star is a problem, you do not observe the initial assignment, but you only observe which classroom did they go to or which classroom they were finally enrolled in, in kindergarten, then, um, then you cannot uh, essentially know, there is no possibility of knowing what was the random assignment. All you observe is which classroom they did go to. But it turns out that in the STAR experiment only about 0.3 percent of the students in the experiment were not enrolled in the class type to which they were randomly assigned in kindergarten. So, even if there was non-random switching that constitutes only 0.3 percent of the sample, but even if you do have non-random switching one way to test if the randomization went well as we have seen several times before and we have discussed several times before is to see whether the covariates are balanced between the different class types or whether the children who went to the uh, small class type as opposed to the regular class type and the regular class type with aid whether they look similar or not across uh, um, along various um, aspects. So, what would you do is that ideally you would want to have baseline test score information on the students, which is uh, even before school started in kindergarten, you would want to know whether the cognitive ability or some baseline test score in uh, some educational test score, whether that is balanced across the small and the large or uh, small and the regular class types. But the problem is that in STAR experiment, there was no such test score available. So, baseline, baseline test score information on students is not available. But what else could you do in the absence of baseline test scores? You could control for the fact that um, or you could, you could look at what are the other characteristics of children who went to these different class types. So, you could compare them along other measurable dimens dimensions at baseline. So, this is exactly what the authors do in the paper. So, they look at small regular and regular class sizes with aid and they look at various characteristics. The first one as you can see is free lunch. Now, what is free lunch? Free lunch, uh, so these are US schools remember and uh, in, in, in the US free lunch is served to students who come from poor background. So, free lunch in other words is a proxy for your uh, income background from which the child is coming to the school. So, the reason it, this is important is that typically if you believe that uh, children coming from disadvantaged backgrounds need more attention in class, then in a non-random setting you are likely to put children coming from poorer backgrounds in small class sizes. So, this is one possibility. 
Another conflicting possibility is the following that children coming from richer backgrounds or better parental backgrounds, it is possible that their parents care more about their children when they come from richer backgrounds. And what they would do is they would push for the child to be in the small classroom because they know these uh, richer parents know that my child is going to benefit more from small classrooms. So, it is also possible that there is non-random assignment into small and regular class sizes depending on parental income background and hence it is important to check whether the in income backgrounds of children who were placed in regular classes as opposed to small classes are similar or not. The other factor that um, is available in the data is race of the child that is whether the child is white, Hispanic or Asian or um, African American and what they have over here, what they show you over here is white or Asian as opposed to being Hispanic or African American. The third one is the age of the child because again there is um, uh, enough research to show that children who start school early actually um, are, uh, dis are at a disadvantage to children who start school late because children who start school late are matured and hence they can learn better. So, you want the small and the regular classes to have similar age groups of children. The fourth one is the attrition rate which is again you do not want non-random dropping out of the sample. Um, as we discussed, it is possible that children are more likely to drop out of regular class sizes because their parents once they get into regular class sizes care more about their children being in small class sizes and suppose they take the child out of the school and put them in a different school so that they can go to a small class size. So, it is important to check whether attrition rates are similar across the small, the regular and the regular class size with aid. And finally, what we have is we just look at uh, the average class sizes um, across the small regular and regular class with aid and the percentile score in kindergarten which is our outcome variable of interest. Now, what you see across all these rows and columns is that across each of these covariates or characteristics, it is more or less balanced across the three class types. So, what you have in the final column is this joint p value which is basically testing for the fact that whether these numbers 0 0.68, 0 0.67 and 0 0.66 they are jointly significantly different from each other or not. And what you have over here is a p value of 0 0.26 which means you fail to reject the hypothesis that they are similar indeed. And this as you see you can reject the uh, reject the dissimilarity of the coefficients uh, in, in the case in the second case of race, in the case of age which means that the children are of similar age across the three class types, the children are of similar race across the three class types and when it comes to free lunch which is an income indicator. we are not fully able to reject the possibility that the coefficients are indeed dissimilar because this is still significant at the 10 percent level. Particularly when we come to attrition rate do we see that the coefficients are indeed very dissimilar because they are significant at a 5 percent level. So, some of these differences are statistically significant overall particularly the one in income and um, attrition rates. Now, because random assignment was only valid within schools, these differences suggest that the importance uh, of controlling for school effects. What does it mean? So, we already saw that um, the randomization in case of star experiment was not a complete randomization or not a full randomization in the sense that children were placed into small regular and regular class sizes with aid only randomly within schools, but not across schools. And hence it is important to control for the fact that the randomization was within a particular school. So, how do we do that? So, that is what you see in this table. So, what this table does is the following. 
So, what you would want to do is um, or what the authors did was to take out the school effects and then compare the characteristics across the different types of classes. So, within each school they were looking for differences in characteristics across the different types of classes. Now, how would you go about doing this? The method is, so suppose you are interested in this variable x i which is let us say the free school, uh, free lunch in school. So, for child i you are uh, try, uh, x represents an indicator whether they uh, whether that particular child qualifies for a free school lunch and what you want to do is to regress them on the school fixed effects. So, what are the school fixed effects? The school fixed effects are dummy variables for each school that you have in your sample. Now, remember that there are 80 schools in your sample. So, what you would have is you would have 79 dummies reflecting each school and the 80th dummy or any one of the 80 dummies actually le is left out from the regression because that is the reference category. So, you would have 79 school dummies which are school fixed effects. So, basically that is identifying whether the child i is going to school i. Okay, or uh, what is the uh, what is the school of child i? Whether child i is going to school one or school two or school seventy nine or school eighty. So essentially, just to uh, uh, write it uh, in a more elaborate way, what you have is a uh, beta one for uh, let's say school one, a beta two for school two, and so on until a beta 79 for school 79 because 80 is left out as a reference category. And then what you have is you predict the x i hats okay. and then given the x i hats you can calculate the u i hats the residuals. So, these residuals are basically whatever is remaining in each covariate x after you have taken out the school fixed effects. So, which means that now you are looking within each school because you have taken out the school fixed effects. So, you are looking within school 1 and what is the distribution of x within school 1 and what is the distribution of x within school 2. Now, once you have this u i hats uh, or uh, yeah, these residuals, these um, estimated residuals, you want to know whether these within school distributions of x are distributed equally between the different class types and that is exactly what they do in this table over here. So, what, what you should be looking at is this column 1 which is comparable to this column in the previous table. So, in the column 1 what they report is they report the f stat the f uh, test results from a comparison of the u i hats across the small regular and regular class size with aid. Okay. So, what you are doing here is you are checking as in the previous table whether free lunch is distributed equally or with the same probability between the small class type, the regular class type and the regular class type with aid, but now you are looking within its school instead of the full set of a full sample that you had before. Because randomization remember according to uh, the star definition worked within each school and not across all schools. Now, within each school what they find is that as opposed to the previous table where you remember we saw that free lunch is not equally distributed. So, there was some difference in um, uh, in, in children uh, uh, who, who uh, qualify for a free lunch between the small regular and regular class sizes. So, there was a difference in the qualification for free lunch between these class types. There was a difference in attrition rate between the class types is now gone. Now, what you see is that uh, students are no more distributed unequally or in an unbalanced way between the small medium, uh, small regular and regular class size with aid. But what you still see is a difference in attrition rate between these class types. 
So, attrition rate is this means that even within schools attrition rate is not balanced between the small regular and regular class um, uh, uh, regular class with AIDS. So, this possibly means that indeed when parents saw that their child is assigned a regular class type they might have taken their child out of the regular class type of a particular school and put that child in a different school maybe a public school where they could go to a small class type or even a private school we do not know. So, this needs to be accounted for when we do the analysis. So, this graph essentially gives you a kernel density distribution of uh, the of the test scores of these children in different grades. So, you have kindergarten on the top left, then you have first grade, second grade and third grade. So, what you see is that um, what is uh, what is plotted over here is the achievement or the test score uh, results of these children in different grades. And uh, the dotted line that you see in each of these plots is from the regular class type and the continuous line is from the small class type. So, the kernel density plot shows that the average test score of children in the small class type lies to the right of the average test score of children in the regular class type. This essentially shows that the test score as a result of children going to small class type was higher than test scores of children in regular class types. Now, to the extent if you believe that or if, if we are convinced that the randomization went well, then this actually shows you a positive effect of small class size on student test scores on student learning. But remember, we have already seen that uh, the list of flaws or the problems, the potential problems that the star experiment ran into in terms of validity of the randomized um, of the conditional independence assumption. And hence, we turn to a discussion of what is this problem that we are trying to solve with the project with the star experiment and then we would discuss the results that the authors find. So, essentially what we are trying to do in a regression setting is to look at y i j which is the test score of student i in school j and whether that test score depends on the class type that the student goes to. So, s i j is the class type that the student goes to and f i j essentially reflects all other characteristics like family background school resources, unobserved inherent ability that may contribute to students achievement in a given year. Now, in any actual application we will generally lack data on some relevant school family or student characteristics which essentially uh, 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 end up being omitted variables and creating omitted variable bias meaning that. Um, as we discussed already, it is possible that uh, when you look at observational data which is non experimental data, suppose you have information on children's test scores at the end of grade 1 and you also see whether what is the average class size where a child went into or where a child was learning. Now, it is of course, possible that a child who went into a small classroom also comes from a poorer educational background also has parents who are less motivated or more motivated. Now, to the extent that we do not observe all these other factors the parental background, family background or the students inherent motivation and so on and so forth. To the extent that we do not observe all these factors we cannot control for all these factors and there is always a po possibility of an omitted variable. So, uh, an experimental setting essentially helps us to overcome this problem. And what we are estimating in this particular uh, instance of this paper is the outcome which is the test score of child i in class type c and school s of the 80 schools remember. And how does this depend on whether the child goes to a small class type or a regular class type with aid where the omitted category or the reference category is a regular class type. So, the coefficient b 1 is essentially capturing the difference in test scores 
between children in small class types and children in regular class types. The coefficient B2 is capturing the difference in test scores between children in regular class types with aid and children in regular class types without aid. The X i C s that you see over here are all the characteristics that vary by the class type, the school and for child i. For instance, X i s would have age, uh, X i s would have the race of the child and whether they qualify for free lunch and so on and so forth. Additionally and most importantly what the authors do is they control for the school fixed effects reflected in A s. Because remember the variable small class type and regular class type with aid and the regular class type these treatment assignments are random only after controlling for the school fixed effects. That is only within school are these independent of the error term not across schools. So, with random assignment a simple comparison of mean achievement between children in small and large classes provides an unbiased estimate of the effect of class, class size on achievement. The independence between class size assignment and other variables is only valid within schools and hence it is so important to control for these school fixed effects A s. So, this table shows you the results from the previous regression that we uh, just saw and uh, you, you should concentrate right now on the first four columns over here which reflects the OLS estimates of the of this equation that we just saw the ordinary least square linear regression estimates. Now, what you have on the right hand side are the actual uh, uh, actual enrollment of the child whether the child is enrolled in a small class type or a regular class type or a regular class type with 8. So, not the initial assignment, but the actual uh, enrollment which is possibly after switching possibly after dropping out of school and so on and so forth. So, in the very first column what you see is you see that the authors have only taken into account whether a child belongs to a small class or a regular class with aid. There are no school fixed effects over here meaning that it is assuming that there is full randomization where there is not act in reality and uh, what you observe is a coefficient of 4.82 for a small class and a coefficient of 0.12 for a regular class. This means that and the coefficient of course, uh, 4.82 is significant as you can see within parenthesis you have uh, the standard errors and the coefficient on the regular class size with 8 is not significant. So, what this means is that a child who went to a small class as opposed to a regular class has a test score which is higher by 4.8 units. Then in the second column what you what the authors have done is they have accounted for the school fixed effects because recall in this case the randomization works only within schools and not across schools. And what you see is after controlling for the school fixed effects and recall that only after controlling for the school fixed effects do you have all other characteristics balanced across the different class types the small and the regular and the regular with 8. So, in second column actually you have ensured that you do have fully random assignment to small class or regular class within each school. And after you have control for this possibility of potential bias what you see is that you have a higher coefficient 5.37 meaning that children who go to uh, who went to small classes uh, small class uh, types actually have a test score which is 5.3 units higher than children who went to a regular class type. And then in column 3 what you do is you still have the school fixed effects, but in addition to school fixed effects you now additionally control for the race, gender, eligibility for free lunch and after controlling for uh, all these factors what you see is there is not much of a difference actually the uh, co coefficients are almost identical between column 2 and column 3. 
The reason is naturally what we discussed before that uh, because these characteristics are balanced between small class between uh, small class and regular class types once you look within schools they should not have an impact on the coefficient estimate on small class type because this is the true estimate of the effect of small class type as uh, as compared to the regular class type but note a very important difference between column 2 and column 4 which is that even though these covariates the race gender and free lunch they do not matter for the correct estimate of the small class type or the correct estimate of the treatment effect what they do matter for is the precision of the estimate as you can see the precision of the estimate has improved from column 2 to column 3 because now you have accounted for these variables which also affect test scores. Now, because you have taken out variability in test score which is explained by these variables and then the small class type explains the remaining variability in the test score what you have over here is a smaller standard error than what you see in column 2 although the difference is not very large, but this is essentially in spirit affecting the, uh, the precision of the estimates. And then in column 4 all that you do is to increase the number of covariates in your regression. So, now you also include the teacher characteristics in addition to the student characteristics what you have is whether the teacher is a white American as opposed to an African American or Asian or Hispanic. Then you have teacher experience and then teachers education, but the important part to see is that after controlling for so many different characteristics of teachers and students the main coefficient on the small class type as opposed to the regular class type does not change meaning that in the very second column once you had accounted for the school fixed effects it was a randomized assignment into small class type as opposed to a regular class type and hence the coefficient does not depend on controlling for other covariates, but what it does affect consistently across column 2, 3 and 4 is the precision of the estimate. So, so far so good. Now, recall that uh, there was a difference in attrition rates between the small and the regular class sizes which we have not talked about yet. So, we need to do something about uh, the difference in attrition rates between the small and the regular class sizes. So, so far what we have done is to regress um, the actual enrollment that is whether you are enrolled in a small or a regular class type and uh, the impact of that uh, of a small class type on your uh, test scores. Uh, it is virtually impossible to prevent some students from switching between class types over time. So, this is reflected in the attrition rate the difference in attrition rate that we saw uh, before. So, uh, what we could do is what or we, what we want to do over here is to change or to address the fact that the actual class size where a student is enrolled when we observe the student is not the initial assignment because this is after switching and this switching given that is it is uh, potentially non random because it is the students who, who switch are essentially students who are put into possibly the regular class sizes they want to switch to small class sizes. So, given that it is non random we uh, want to address this problem. So, one way of uh, addressing this problem is instead of using the uh, actual enrollment or the actual class type that you are enrolled in what you do is you use the initial assignment because the initial assignment that the experimenter gave the child was essentially random, but non randomness comes in only when the student switches from the assigned class type to the uh, other class type of uh, his or her own choice. So, what you do instead is to run the regression on the initial assignment instead of the current uh, class type and this is what we call a reduced form. So, a reduced form in general is a regression where you have 
only exogenous variables on the right hand side in um, meaning that uh, it satisfies the assumption of conditional independence. So, only the initial assignment is random and hence the initial assignment of the student in a small class or a regular class type is independent of the error term and that is why it is called a reduced form. So, what you see in the uh, from between uh, from columns 5 to 8 is the effect of initial class size on learning experience or on the on the on the learning outcomes the test scores. But to the extent that initial class size is highly correlated with your actual class size or actually where you belong because there is only a small attrition over here. So, to that extent these are close to your structural estimates. Now, remember that these are uh, just intuitively understand that to the extent that your initial class size differs from your actual class size what you observe in columns 1, 2 and 4. 1, 2 uh, through 4. Um, so, to the extent that the initial class size varies from the actual class size, the estimates from in columns 5 to 8 are likely to be different from the structural estimates that is your actual class type, uh, the relationship between your actual class type and the test score. But to the extent that they are not very far apart from each other that is the initial class uh, assignment is not very different from the actual class assignment, these estimates are likely to be close to the estimates in columns 1 through 4. When we discuss instrumental variables later in the later half of this course, what we will see is we can also retrieve the structural estimates from these initial class uh, size or initial assignment by using an instrumental variable approach, but we would keep that discussion for later. For the time being let us look at what happens when we have the truly causal estimates because now we can be sure that these are indeed the randomized assignments which are free of any attrition problem. And what you see over here that the coefficient estimates are very similar to what you find in columns 1 through 4. So, columns 5 through 8 actually replicate columns 1 through 4 apart from the fact that you are using initial class size instead of the actual class size. So far what we have discussed in this paper or through this paper are two very important concepts. One is that you might not always have a full randomization, you could have a conditional randomization and you need to consider that when you are uh, looking at the difference between treatment and control groups in terms of outcomes. So, once you condition on this conditioning variable, then your randomization is perfect and then you can, com uh, you can compare the differences between the treatment and the control groups. So, this is what we have done so far. In the next session what we are going to do is we are uh, going to look at the rest of this paper and also uh, look at other aspects of randomization. Thank you very much for attending today's session.